Thank you. Hello. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. I can't tell if I'm blasting you guys out. Can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. So we are streaming, as we now are apt to do here at the C-Lab, so it's really important that we use the microphone. Um, we have four students today who are presenting as part of our Dauphin Island C-Lab Food and Drug Administration Joint Fellowship Program. Uh, since we have four students, that means these students are going to need to keep pretty strictly to a 12 to 15 minute timeline. So I think what we're going to have to do, yeah, <laughs> I didn't say that. Um, what we're going to have to do is uh, limit it probably to one question per person. But what I invite you guys to do is stick around afterward if you have more questions, because we definitely want to give these students a chance to benefit from your questions. So please stick around afterward if you have more questions, if you're not picked for one of the ones, uh, and they'll all be available to answer questions for anyone who can stay a little bit longer than the hour. So we're going to get started today with Haley Gansel. Haley came into the FDA program in 2014 as a master's student and enjoyed it so much she decided to nestle in and stay for a PhD. So she is now, I think I can say, terminal. Right? Very, very soon to be finishing. So we're, <laughs> we're going to uh, start off and we're going to proceed today in the order of entry to the program. So go ahead. Okay. Okay, um, so before I start, I want to mention my advisors. So for FDA, I'm working with Dr. Burkhart and Kevin Kelsey, and here my advisor is Dr. Ruth Carmichael. And the title of my talk today is Straight to the Source, Understanding Wastewater Inputs in a Freshwater-Dominated System. So freshwater inputs deliver nutrient and microbial pollution to coastal systems from human and animal waste. And nutrient pollution is a problem because it can lead to eutrophication. And microbial pollution, on the other hand, is a public health concern that can lead to shellfish harvest closures due to risks of consumption of contaminated shellfish. So together, nutrient and microbial inputs can degrade water quality. And there are many different sources of nutrients and microbial inputs into a system including non-point sources such as rivers and stormwater runoff. And we also have point sources such as wastewater treatment plants. And it's estimated that 36,000 kilometers cubed per year of freshwater discharge reaches global oceans, potentially carrying with it nutrient and microbial pollution. And due to higher surface flows, freshwater-dominated systems potentially have higher nutrient and microbial inputs. And here on the northern Gulf of Mexico, we have, the, have Mobile Bay, which is a freshwater influence system. And here we have the Mobile Bay watershed with the purple dots indicating major wastewater treatment plants within the system. So we can see that we can possibly get nutrient and microbial inputs from the watershed, but we also have local smaller rivers discharging into our system and wastewater treatment plants that can both also deliver nutrients and microbes to the system. And Mobile Bay is also a really great study area because we have areas of higher freshwater flow and lower flow, and it's unknown how different areas of flow within the same system can influence point and non-point source pollution. For this talk today, I have three hypotheses. The first one is that within each high and low flow subsystem of Mobile Bay and Mississippi Sound, the river and wastewater treatment plant are equal sources of wastewater indicators. And for this talk, wastewater indicators were measured with nutrients and indicator microbes. Secondly, individual source types are equal wastewater sources between the high and low flow subsystem. And lastly, that wastewater sources will have no effect on wastewater indicators at receiving sites within high and low flow subsystems. And we tested these hypotheses um, seasonally and annually. To determine wastewater indicators and potential wastewater sources, we measured nutrients and indicator microbes in wastewater treatment plants indicated by the outfall symbols and river discharge sites, which are the circles. Um, for nutrients and indicator microbes. And then to determine if wastewater sources had an influence on downstream receiving sites, we also measured nutrients and indicator microbes at receiving sites, which are, which are indicated by those triangles. And we sampled all of these sites once a month for two warm and two cold seasons. 
And we also split our sampling into a high flow and low flow region where our high flow region had sources that were larger than in our low flow system. To determine nutrients, water samples were collected a few hours after high tide to capture indicators leaving the river. And then we also determined nutrients outflowing from wastewater treatment plants, and we collected effluent samples the same way, except for tidal stage was not important. And water samples were then filtered, and the filtrate was kept and analyzed for this suite of nutrients and um, using standard methods here at the lab. And then we also measured indicator microbes. Water samples were collected the same way. And we measured fecal coliforms in E. coli, which are traditional indicator bacteria using membrane filtration. And we also measured male-specific coliphage, which is an alternative indicator virus using the double auger overlay method. And now transitioning into results, where I'm going to show you some of our indicator concentration results first. With, this is showing nitrate nitrite concentrations in the high flow and low flow subsystem. And on our primary y axis, we have our receiving site concentrations indicated in gray and our river concentrations in blue. And on the secondary y axis are the wastewater treatment plant nutrient concentrations. And data are separated by season and year on the x axis. And what we found is that. For nit nitrate nitrite, wastewater treatment plant concentrations were always higher compared to the rivers. And, but we also found that that high flow wastewater treatment plant actually had lower nutrient concentrations than the low flow wastewater treatment plant. And we also found some seasonal differences. So this is a graph showing the high flow river in bl bright blue and the low flow river in this teal color and note the differences in scale. So this is showing the flow rate of those two rivers. And during the cold season when we had higher river flow, we found higher nitrate nitrite concentrations in our rivers potentially due to runoff. And just briefly looking at our ammonium results, again, we found that the wastewater treatment plant had higher concentrations compared to the river. But this time, the high flow wastewater treatment plant actually had a higher ammonium concentrations than the low flow wastewater treatment plant. Now, this is set up exactly like the previous slide, but now we're looking at indicator microbes, starting with the fecal coliforms. And with fecal coliforms, we found that they were higher in the river than the wastewater treatment plant. And we also saw similar seasonal patterns that we saw with the nitrate nitrite, where there was a trend of higher indicator bacteria in the rivers in the cold season. And for male-specific coliphage, which is, again, our indicator virus, we had a lot of non-detect measurements, but we did see that the high-flow wastewater treatment plant had higher concentrations. Okay. And then what we did is we looked at the relative influence of the two sources, the wastewater treatment plant and the river. And to do this, we first calculated the load of the source. So that was the source concentration multiplied by the source flow rate. And then we calculated a load ratio, which was just the wastewater treatment plant load divided by the river load. And so when you see a load ratio of less than one, that indicates that your river, that the river is the larger source but greater than one would indicate the wastewater treatment plan is a larger source. So these are results showing the load ratio for nitrate nitrite um, separated by season and year again. And the first thing to notice is that in the high flow subsystem, these load ratios are far less than one, so your river is the larger source. But in the low flow, um, load ratios are greater than one, indicating that the wastewater treatment plant is your larger source. And we also saw seasonal shifts in the relative influence of the wastewater treatment plant and the river. For example, during the cold season, when river flows were higher, we saw that load ratios within both subsystems decreased, meaning that your river influence is increasing. And conversely, in the warm season, when we had lower river flow, the load ratios are increasing, meaning that your wastewater treatment plant influence is increasing compared to the cold season. And our ammonium load ratio results show that the wastewater treatment plant is a larger source in both the high and the low flow subsystem. And results for indicator microbes for our load ratios, the first thing to notice is that the load ratios are um, a lot smaller than one. So 
the rivers are larger sources of indicator microbes. And then we also found that our load calculation was really the dominant flow per parameter when we calculated these loads, and that was due to the fact that we had a lot of non-detect measurements with our indicator microbes. And furthermore, this MSC point is showing that it's high because we had a lot of non-detect measurements in the MSC, coupled with the fact that the wastewater treatment plant flow in the low flow subsystem comprised a larger portion of the river flow compared to in the high flow subsystem. So again, that load ratio is increasing, so you're seeing more of an influence of the wastewater treatment plant. But again, these ratios are still far less than one, so the river is the main source for these indicator microbes. And then to determine if source loads or environmental attributes explained indicator concentrations at re downstream receiving sites, um, we performed information theoretic model selection. So these graphs are showing nutrient concentrations of the receiving site on your y-axis and then source loads for the river in blue and the wastewater treatment plant in green on the x-axis. So when you do these model selections, you get outputs kind of like this where we have your models, then you have a delta AICC with zero being your best model fit, and then a W, which is the model weights, which range from zero to one, one being a perfect model fit. And for the high flow subsystem, what this is showing is that as river nitrate nitrite load increased, so did the nitrate nitrite concentrations at the receiving sites. But we also have a model here that has both of our sources, the wastewater treatment plant and the river load, with a model weight of 0.1. And when you have a model weight of 0.1, that means that you can't discount that model. And thus, this means that the wastewater treatment plant is also a potential source of nutrients in the system. And briefly, these are the results of all the other nutrients. And what we find is that the river load, um, as the river nutrient load increased, so did nutrient concentrations at that high flow receiving site, um, except for with ammonium. And conversely, in the low flow subsystem, we find that it was the wastewater treatment plant nutrient load that increased those nitrate nitrite concentrations at that low flow site. And that river doesn't even factor into these models. And then we found that it depended on the nutrient species as to whether the wastewater treatment plant or the river was a larger source or was a source to nearby locations in the low flow subsystem. And briefly, um, these are indicator bacteria results. And what we find is that we have a model that says river fecal coliform loads plus the DON concentration at the receiving site explains fecal coliform concentrations at the receiving sites. So again, these, this is just a graph showing you those source loads and the fecal coliform concentrations. Um, but we also need to take a step back and look at our results, our model selection results explaining DON concentrations at the receiving sites. So what we found is that as the river DON load increased, so did the DON concentrations at that receiving site. So what this means is that rivers were both directly influencing fecal coliform concentrations by one, directly providing indicator bacteria to that site, but also by increasing nutrients to that site and increasing uh, bacterial growth. And lastly, in the low flow subsystem, we only had one time point when we had indicator bacteria above detection, and that was when the wastewater treatment plant disinfection system malfunctioned. Within subsystems, rivers had lower nutrient and higher indicator bacteria concentrations compared to the wastewater treatment plants. But when looking between our high and low flow sources, it depended on the nutrient and indicator microbe species as to which source dominated. And we also saw that the flow parameter of our load calculation was the most dominating parameter in this freshwater discharge system. And we saw that seasonal differences in nitrate nitrite indicator bacteria and that relative source influence was due to shifts in flow, <clears throat> particularly river flow. And rivers and wastewater treatment plants were both wastewater sources to nearby sites, but overall rivers were our larger source, except during periods of high wastewater treatment plant flow, 
which I didn't talk about today, but it is important to note. And different flow regimes within the same system mediate source influence, indicating local hydrology and source volume is important when identifying and quantifying wastewater inputs. And these results will aid in understanding how relative source dominance influence changes under different flow regimes in these freshwater dominated estuaries. It will be imperative to protect water quality and human health. And I'd like to thank my funding sources and everybody who helped. <laughs> Any questions? Well, one. All right, can everybody hear me? So my name is Vicki. Um, like she said, I work between Dr. Bill Walton at the Auburn Shellfish Lab as well as Dr. Jessica Jones at the FDA Lab. And today I'm just going to give you a little bit of a progress report on my dissertation, which is titled The Test of the Effects of Geography, Gear Type, and Culture Techniques on Vibrio Risks Associated with Farm-Raised Oysters. So during this oyster farming process, um, Farmers will do these routine handling practices in order to improve the quality of their oyster. So farmers will desiccate their oysters or air dry them. They will also tumble them through a mechanical grater, and they will sort and grade their oysters by hand. All of these things can help to reduce biofouling, like barnacles, mudworms, and it will improve the shell shape and quality of that oyster. In the end, the farmer can actually create this perfect, beautiful, deep-cupped oyster that will earn them a higher profit on the half-shell market. But during these routine handling practices, those oysters are actually removed from the water for extended periods of time, and this can actually cause an increased health risk um, from Vibrio bacteria. For those of you that don't know, Vibrio are uh, naturally found in estuarine waters, and they are pathogenic bacteria to human. The two humans, um, there are two species of a public health risk. The first is Vibrio vulnificus, or VV. This species can cause acute septicemia and wound infections, and it's important because it has the highest case fatality rate of any foodborne pathogen. The second species of a public health risk is Vibrio perihemolyticus, or VP. This species causes wound infections as well as gastroenteritis, and it's important because it is the leading cause of seafood infection in our country. So during these routine handling um, practices, the oysters are removed from the water and they are exposed to elevated air temperatures, in addition to the fact that their filter feeding is interrupted. This will cause the vibrio levels to increase within that oyster, um, causing an increased health risk to humans. But oyster farmers have this unique option to basically put those oysters back in the water, and that's what we call resubmersion. And in doing so, the oysters will open up again and resume pumping, and those elevated bacteria levels will be purged and returned back to ambient levels. Now, after the resubmersion period is complete, the farmer can go back out there and harvest their oysters within an appropriate time temperature window and sell them for consumption on the raw half-shell market. Now, currently in Alabama, uh, regulations state that farmers have to observe either a 7 or 14 day resubmersion period. Um, this depends on the gear type that they are using to grow their oysters as well as the handling type they are using. But a lot can happen during that 14 day period. Um, for example, mudworms can actually reinfest the oysters again. Um, you can also have barnacle oversets that can occur as well as farmers run the risk of having um, rainfall closure shut down harvesting. And you can see in the graph here, in 2016 this was an issue, almost half of the um, year was closed for harvest um, from things such as rainfall closures. So basically there's all these risks during a 14 day period that can 
kind of eliminate the benefits of doing the routine handling practices. So the goal of my entire dissertation is to provide data that can create best management practices that will balance the industry needs as well as public health. So my dissertation has looked at several different factors that could affect resubmersion. Um, the past two years, I've given seminars that have looked at my first two objectives. Um, so to briefly summarize that for those of you that missed that, my first objective um, looked at the effects of different handling types on oysters that were grown in Portersville Bay, Alabama. So we looked at three different handling types. The first was tumbling, which roughly handles the oysters. It's basically sending them through a giant rock tumbler. So we wanted to know how did that affect the oyster once it went back into the water compared to just simply air drying them or lifting them up out of the water. Then we also wanted to look at the idea of a refrigeration treatment where you could put the oysters into mechanical refrigeration while they're out of the water. That way you can prevent significant increases in Vibrio bacteria. But does that have any adverse effects once those oysters go back into the water? So overall, we found in this first objective that there was no significant effect of that rough handling type of tumbling on the resubmersion period, but we did see a significant effect of refrigeration, which you'll see in a little bit as well. Um, regardless of that, a seven-day resubmersion period was sufficient, and I currently have a manuscript in prep for this work. For my second objective, we wanted to move on to look at two other factors of gear type and season. Um, this study was done at our newest farm site in Grand Bay, Alabama. And the reason why we wanted to look at gear type was because we did have that difference in resubmersion period for farmers using those two different gear types. Um, we have the adjustable longline system in the picture on the top and the floating oyster grow system in the picture on the bottom. Those systems hold the oysters at different places in the water column and that could potentially affect the resubmersion time. Additionally, we had only done studies in the summer months under the assumption that the summer held the highest risk for Vibrio infection, but we kind of wanted to expand it into the cooler months of the year to see if that seven-day resubmersion rule still worked in those times of the year. So what we actually found during this study was that pathogenic VP levels were actually higher during the spring months than during the summer months, which we had thought was the worst case scenario. But regardless of this, we found a seven-day resubmersion period was, regard was sufficient regardless of the gear type or the season. So for today, I wanted to focus on objective three, which brought in a new question of geography and how different Vibrio populations on a different coastline could affect um, resubmersion. So I did some work in Cedar Island, North Carolina, and this study was actually designed to where we could compare it to the work done at the same time in Grand Bay, Alabama. So for this objective, I wanted to look at the effects of handling techniques on the levels of Vibrio and cultured oysters from Cedar Island, North Carolina. For this study, I performed four trials at a previously established farm site owned and operated by Jay Styron of Carolina Mariculture. He let me come out five different treatments. The first is a submersed control. This, these were oysters that were left in the water during the entire experiment. That way they could provide us the ambient levels of Vibrio bacteria within the oysters over time. For the handling treatments, I removed all Half of them were tumbled or sent through a mechanical grater once. The other half were not tumbled and simply remained in their bags. From there, I took half of the tumbled and half of the not tumbled oysters and placed them into a portable refrigeration unit overnight for 18 plus or minus two hours, while the other oysters that were not refrigerated just remained outside overnight. So this gave me four different handling combinations of tumbled, not refrigerated, tumbled refrigerated, not tumbled refrigerated, and not tumbled not refrigerated, which is essentially a desiccated treatment. Now during each trial, I took samples at certain days. That way we can capture those changes in Vibrio levels over time. So before I did anything, I collected pretreatment samples to quantify the Vibrio levels from the beginning. Then I had my treatment period where I pulled those oysters out of the water and applied those treatments. Then, immediately after that, I collected post-treatment samples and put the oysters back in the water for that 14-day resubmersion period. 
I collected samples at days 1, 3, 7, 10, and 14 days after resubmersion, and I took all of those oyster samples back to the lab and tested them for four different Vibrio types. So you had total VV, total VP, and pathogenic VP, which is TDH positive or TRH positive. All of those, I was able to use a linear mixed effects model with an interaction term to analyze the data. So today I just have some of my preliminary results from the two trials I performed in 2018. This first graph is going to show you the levels of Vibrio after the handling treatments were applied. So on the x-axis you will see the four different Vibrio types. On the y-axis you see the log NPN per gram. That is the most probable number of bacteria per gram. These green bars are going to show you the submerged control levels. So that is the ambient levels of Vibrio in oysters already. The blue bars are the, and the orange bars are the not refrigerated treatments. So you can see immediately after those treatments were applied, we did see types um, in the not refrigerated treatments with one exception. Um, we did not see it in the TDH positive Vibrio type for the not tumbled, not refrigerated treatment. But those refrigerated treatments actually did not have a significant increase in Vibrio levels overnight. This graph shows you after one day of being back in the water, we actually saw that those refrigerated treatments had a significant increase in Vibrio levels across the board. So basically you took this oyster that was cool in this portable refrigeration unit and then put it back into the warm water. That caused the Vibrio levels to increase actually after putting them back into the water. But after seven days of resubmersion, we found that all of the handling treatments have recovered back to ambient levels. So preliminarily, we did not see any significant effects of tumbling on the Vibrio levels, but we did still see that same significant effect of refrigeration that we did in Portersville Bay. So while rough handling did not affect the resubmersion time, you need to be careful with refrigeration because once you put the oysters back in the water, the Vibrio levels will actually increase before they decrease again. Regardless, we did find that a seven-day resubmersion period was sufficient. Um, it did not matter what handling type you used. And in this case, some Vibrio types recovered faster than others. We saw that Total VV and pathogenic VP recovered in three days, but it took all seven days for those total VP levels to recover back to ambient. So I actually just recently completed all the PCR for the 2019 trials that I did in North Carolina. So I will be analyzing that data and I will be able to compare those results to the similar study from Grand Bay, Alabama. And then up next, I will be working on my fourth objective which is going to use whole genome sequencing to look at changes in Vibrio population diversity during resubmersion. So we want to see, during this resubmersion period, does the Vibrio population become more homogenous or more diverse over time? So to prepare for this, I have been working on saving isolates the past four summers. Um, I basically streak from all of my sample tubes onto selective media. That way I can isolate both VV and VP. Um, I've been working on pulling those out of the freezer and purifying the isolates and characterizing them. That way I can ultimately choose which um, isolates I want to sequence. And with that, I would like to give a big shout out to all of my uh, folks at each lab, as well as my funding sources and the awesome people I worked with in North Carolina. Yes, sir. Uh, so why springs? Why is that the water temperature was cooler. It wasn't outcompeted by the total levels. So I I was, I was they had higher pathogenic levels than we see in the summer. So the pathogenic VP are the ones that are going to actually cause the illness. And so you would think summertime has the worst case scenario, but we actually saw higher levels of the pathogenic VP during the spring months, which is cooler. The, the water temperatures were cooler, um, so I don't really think that we know why. why. Others have seen the same thing.
So I wasn't specifically looking at how the treatments affected oyster quality. These routine handling practices have been shown in other studies to increase the quality of your oyster. So that's what we were basing it off of. All right, next up is Ashley Frith. Ashley is a master's student in the program who started with us in 2017. All right, um, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the effects of time and temperature on histamine and histamine producing bacteria in decomposing Spanish mackerel. So histamine fish poisoning is one of the most common seafood borne illnesses in the United States. It occurs after human consumption of fish that contains high levels of histamine. And the illness occurs typically in fish that have naturally high levels of histidine, which is active fish like tuna, mackerel, and mahi. And this happens after the fish dies, when naturally occurring bacteria, histamine-producing bacteria, or HPB as I'm gonna to refer to them, can get into those fish tissues and convert that naturally occurring histidine to histamine. And histamine is toxic to humans in high enough concentrations. Histamine is the same compound that your body produces when you're having an allergic reaction. So the symptoms of histamine fish poisoning look very similar to that. The FDA has set some guidelines for histamine in fish, where 50 parts per million of histamine is considered evidence of decomposition, and 500 parts per million histamine is considered a potential human health hazard. And those numbers are gonna come back up later. The histamine fish poisoning is a global problem, as you can see from this map, where the countries in red are ones where I found documented outbreaks of histamine fish poisoning. And even this map is likely an underrepresentation of the global nature of this problem, because many countries do not have the same regulations for how you report foodborne illnesses, and histamine fish poisoning often goes undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. Histamine fish poisoning is also a current issue, as you can see from this headline from 2017. Scombroid fish poisoning is another name for histamine fish poisoning because a lot of the fish that cause histamine fish poisoning do tend to be of the scombroid family. So histamine fish poisoning is thought to mainly occur by storing fish at temperatures above refrigeration for extended periods of time. And so a lot of studies will take one or more known strains of these HPB and inoculate fish with them to see how these known species grow in a fish and produce histamine. But I'm looking at natural populations of HPB in fish. So I'm not inoculating my fish and seeing how these communities of HPB grow and produce histamine. In addition, there's a lot of variation in histamine concentrations between fish and even within a single fish but we don't really know why, and there doesn't seem to be a common consensus about how these things vary. Some studies found higher concentrations of histamine near the head of decomposing fish. Some studies have found no difference across a fish. So I'm using Spanish mackerel, which are a family of fish that have been implicated in outbreaks of histamine fish poisoning, to examine these naturally occurring HPB and their potential for causing human health issues. So for this talk, my objective is to determine how the concentrations of HPB and the associated histamine vary in fish tissues during decomposition at different temperatures, where I suspect that the concentration of HPB and therefore the histamine present during decomposition will be greater at higher temperatures, at longer incubation times, and will be greater near the head of the fish than near the tail. So to quantify the HPB in fish tissues, we went out and caught Spanish mackerel, which were euthanized in sterile bags and put on ice. And then on turn to the lab, the fish were put in one of three incubation temperatures, four degrees for up to 14 days, 15 degrees for up to seven days, or 30 degrees for up to 48 hours. And we had at least two fish at each time point. Sometimes we had more than that. After the incubation time, fish were sectioned into four equal width sections, as you can see from that diagram, where section one was closest to the head and section four was closest to the tail. We took portions from each of those sections and made serial dilutions, and from that we ran a real-time PCR on all those dilutions, targeting the histidine decarboxylase gene, which is what allows these bacteria to convert 
histidine to histamine. And from the results from those PCRs, we can use a table to determine the most probable number, or MPN, of the bacteria in the sample. To determine the histamine in fish tissues, the first steps are the same. So starting from where we section the fish into those four sections, we took 10 grams of fish from each section and blended it with, his, with methanol to extract the histamine. And those samples were then filtered through filter paper to remove the fish tissues. It will run through a column cleanup to remove compounds that we weren't interested in. And then we did a fluorometric reaction, which involves adding four different solutions to the sample that will make the sample fluoresce based on the concentration of histamine. And that fluorescence can be read with a TCAN instrument that you see on the far right there. And from that fluorescence, we can determine the concentration of histamine by comparing it to the fluorescence of solutions with known concentrations of histamine, so generating a standard curve from that. So I'm going to walk through the models, or for the, for the results, one temperature at a time. So we're going to start at 4 degrees, which is our coldest temperature. And at each of these, you will see that section 1 is represented by the darkest color, and it fades to section 4, which will always be gray. The color scheme is going to vary based on which temperature I'm talking about, as you're going to see. The lines shown here on this model are the results of a multiple regression with incubation time and section as factors. And so off to the right, you have the equations for, of the line for each section and their significance groupings. So at 4 degrees, we found that the HPV increased linearly with incubation time, and that the HPV in section 1 were greater than those in section 4. And section 2 and 3 were not statistically different from either one. And do note overall, these are very low concentrations. We only got to a maximum of around 4 log MPM per gram, and you'll see when we get to the other temperatures that they get much higher than this. So when we look at our histamine at 4 degrees, we're using the same color scheme here. We just use squares to denote histamine versus the circles to denote bacteria. And here we found no significant relationship between histamine and either incubation time or section, largely because these are very low histamine concentrations. We found no evidence of decomposition, which is again that 50 parts per million, or human health risk, which would be 500 parts per million. We are well below either of those. And when we move up to 15 degrees, we found that these concentrations were much higher than what we got at 4 degrees. These reached a maximum of around 8 log MPN per gram, whereas remember we only had about 4 at 4 degrees. Here we found that the HPV increased with incubation time to around day 5, after which they decreased or leveled out. And again, here, same idea, you have the equations for the lines for each section off to the right and their significance groupings. So you found that the HPV in section 1 were greater than that in section 4 but sections 2 and 3 were not different from either one. When we, when we look at our histamine from 15 degrees, these concentrations, like the bacteria, were much higher than what we got at 4 degrees. We saw evidence of decomposition, which is that black dotted line at 50 ppm, and human health risk, which is the black dashed line at 500. We saw evidence of both of those by day 3. And here we have the results of a model with incubation time and section as factors, but here we also had a significant interaction between incubation time and section to where the histamine in sections 1 and 2 increased much more rapidly than that in section 4, so we had different slopes there. And at 15 degrees, we also had really large between fish variation. So in all but one fish, the histamine was highest in section 1 and decreased as you move to section 4. But the magnitude of that histamine between two fish that were incubated for the same amount of time was really large, as you can see by the spread of the data here. For our 30 degree HPB, we found that the maxima was not very different from what we found at 15 degrees. These bacteria are just growing much more, much more quickly, obviously. So our x-axis here is in terms of hours. We go up to 48 hours, where at 15 degrees, we were only going up to seven days. And here we found that HPV increased with incubation time to about hour 30, after which there was a much more clear decrease than what we saw at 15 degrees. And again here, like at many of our other temperatures, we found that the HPV in section 1 was greater than that in section 4, where 2 and 3 were not different from either one. 
for our histamine at 30 degrees. Similar to the 15 degree results, we found that the histamine was not that much greater than at 15 degrees. It just happened much faster. So we saw evidence of decomposition, again, that dotted line by hour 15, and evidence of human health risk, which is the dashed line, by hour 27. And here we found the histamine in section one was greater than in any of the other sections. But also here, like with what we had at 15 degrees, there's large between fish variation. So fish incubated for the same amount of time have drastically different histamine concentrations. And you can see that, especially at those middle incubation times where we have a large range in histamine concentrations. So overall, we found that these naturally occurring histamine producing bacteria were much lower at refrigeration temperatures than what we got at 15 degrees or at 30 degrees. We also found that in Spanish mackerel at least, there are higher natural HPV populations in the anterior sections than there are in the posterior sections, regardless of incubation temperature, which is neat. For the histamine, we found that refrigeration prevented histamine levels indicative of decomposition and human health risk. And this is in line with current FDA recommendations, which are to store fish at or below four degrees Celsius as soon as possible after catch. We also find that at 15 degrees and at 30 degrees, once the histamine in the Spanish mackerel reached 50 parts per million to where they would be considered decomposed, the anterior sections had higher histamine and thus posed a greater human health risk than those posterior sections. And so that lines up with what we found with the bacteria, which is also very neat. So I want to thank the Dauphin Island Sea Lab USFDA Joint Fellowship Program for allowing me to do this work. Um, my advisors, Dr. Carmichael and Dr. Butler, for helping me and everyone who provided a lot of assistance in the field and in the lab. And I'll take a question. So we think it, that the bacteria might be coming from the gut. Um, we don't know, so we're doing a whole lot more work, um, and I'm identifying, isolating and identifying a bunch of bacteria. So I have bacteria from water samples, from gill, skin, and swabs, and from the tissues. So if we try and see where those bacteria are, um, doing, they're doing some other studies right now looking at like gutted versus ungutted fish and seeing if we have different concentrations then. Um, yeah, we think they're coming from the gut, but so we don't really know. We don't think so, but I can't really say. <laughs> Working on that. <laughs> All right. So next up is our newest member to the program. This is Steve Dextra, who joined us just this year. So um, I look forward to seeing what you have. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I officially just got my badge yesterday, so I am part of things, and uh, and uh, would like to start out just by thanking thanking the FDA um, uh, and Dissel for 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 allowing me um, this opportunity. Uh, so today, I want to share with you a fresh approach for uh, shellfish closures. Uh, it's fresh because we're talking about fresh water. Uh, here today. Uh, so thanks to uh, my advisors uh, for helping me through this, uh, Brian uh, Zonkowski, Kevin Kelsey, and Kelly Dorgan. Uh, uh, so I want to uh, share with you uh, three problems uh, that, um, uh, that kind of uh, scope out uh, and uh, get at my, my primary question and then the proposed study uh, that I'm doing. But before we get too far, we always have to have some motivation uh, for the work that, that we're doing. Uh, so when you think about seafood, I uh, usually think of initially about it as, as a food source. And so the first thing, thing that may come to mind as well is uh, food safety with that. Uh, but also, uh, seafood is a very important business. Um, uh, throughout the world. Uh, in fact, in the United States, the FDA regulates uh, 20 percent uh, of the, of, of the uh, gross, gross domestic product. And so when you take, take, 
take uh, the food source and the business aspect of this, uh, this, this actually becomes uh, a food security concern and also, and also uh, 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 a national security concern. Uh, so if you look at the plot here um, on the bottom, uh, we can see that there, that there is a global uh, demand for meat right now. Uh, this is due to uh, uh, emerging markets um, and shifts uh, in global demand. Uh, so you can see from 2005 to 2050, uh, uh, there's not only an increase, but also a shift in the market. Uh, but then when we include uh, seafood in this, you can see that the wild capture uh, has actually been, been uh, plateauing. And, and aquaculture is really kind of taking off to fill in that gap. So locally in Alabama, uh, we have 14 operators that are valued around, around uh, $2 million in growing. Uh, so this is ki kind of exciting here, but there are some large challenges uh, to this, uh, which, which really some people have kind of hit on before, but uh, just kind of uh, reiterate uh, some of the problems uh, that can come about. Uh, the first one here is is uh, fecal pollution. Uh, so 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 this this can uh, compromise food safety, and it usually occurs during periods of of high rainfall, high wastewater, and high river discharge. Uh, these can these can uh, coincide, but they can also be at completely different time time periods as well. So the general solution uh, is to is to simply manage. Uh, the fisheries to close uh, underneath these these uh, threatened conditions, and so the result is uh, is is a, is a acceptable food safety uh, loss 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 of inventory and money with that. Uh, so so this can vary um, uh, region to region, but if we think about it here in Alabama, uh, uh, it really changes um, uh, year to year. Uh, but if, if you look at like 2016, there on the far right, uh, we had. We had as many days uh, closed as we had had opened, approximately. Um, <clears throat> so, so this kind of uh, begs begs the question: you know, could we do do better uh, in in our closure approaches? Uh, which which bring, brings us to problem number two, in that in that uh, uh, discharge closures are determined using using old uh, correlations uh, that can be lacking in causation, uh, and they can really vary uh, region to region and have, have different issues with that. Locally in Alabama, uh, uh, the, the approach that we have here was, was established in 1982. And uh, what they did was they had, they had a data set of, of fecal coliform, and they systematically went through and just said, what correlates with our fecal coliform. And they found that, uh, that uh, at the Berry Steam Plant, uh, when the water level exceeded uh, eight feet, uh, it correlated well and had a spike um, in the fecal coliform. And so this really has, has, has now been established as, as our local trigger here. However, there is no uh, hydrodynamic explanation for this. And so it really begs the question of, so what is the physical causation for the correlation? Uh, and so also, if you think about this uh, at the Berry Steam Plant, we're only measuring water level. We're not actually measuring the discharge. And so this is, this, this is because of the complex delta system that we have. Uh, and it brings us to our third problem, which is really that, that, that discharge uh, can only be accurately measured far inland. Uh, so, so, so this brings about large uncertainty in both timing and magnitude in the downstream uh, regions. And so you might ask, well, why is this? Uh, so discharge measurements uh, become very poor and noisy uh, in low sloping regions, uh, backwater environments, and also in marine, uh, in areas where the marine influences uh, can penetrate inland. Uh, so locally in Alabama, our discharge is measured uh, up on the, on the Tom Bigby River and the Alabama River. Uh, from here, by water, it's 238 kilometers. Uh, so if you, were to, if you were to just drive straight there, it would take you about two hours. Uh, so if you just think about, think about the water flowing that entire distance, you can think about how noisy and, and how poor it could be to really uh, create uh, good expectations for that river discharge. Uh, 
Uh, in fact, this is a fairly similar distance uh, to, to the measurements that are made on the Columbia River and the Hudson River and uh, quite a few other places. And so it's, it's not just simply a local problem either. Um, in fact, how, how many of you here have had to at some point estimate uh, coastal discharge, um, some sort of river, river volume flow? Okay, quite a few people here. So it's, it really is kind of a wide um, uh, problem. Uh, so there's been a handful, uh, or I should say a couple of new approaches uh, that people have been trying to use. Uh, one is to, is to use uh, water level and velocity measurements. Uh, so you can see in the top, in the top uh, picture here, uh, we have an upward looking ADCP for the velocity measurements and then a water level measurement. And, and then we take that and it can be uh, calibrated using cross uh, cross-channel uh, uh, velocity measurements using, using another, another ADCP uh, with that. And so, and so this, is, this, this is a great method, but it has uh, some limitations. Uh, so so it, it, it only works underneath river-dominated regions and uh, in-channel flow. Uh, so it, uh, uh, the, the Buck Station um, uh, near the Barry Steam Plant is a great example of, of the station and generally works well uh, in the in-channel flow conditions. Uh, another, another approach uh, uses, uses uh, the damping that occurs on uh, tides when, when river discharge increases. So as discharge uh, increases, uh, tides become smaller. Uh, and so, so you can see in, in the plot on the right in the Fraser River. Uh, we have the, uh, the uh, semi-diurnal uh, tide on the, on the x-axis there, and then on the y-axis, uh, the upstream uh, discharge. And in general, you can see it makes, make, makes a decent curve uh, there. But uh, this also has, has limitations in that it only works in a, fairy, in a fairly narrow spatial region. And it has, has a very low temporal resolution of, of around a week. Uh, and, so, and, so, and so both of these newer approaches as well, their biggest problem, in fact, is that they both fail at high discharge conditions. And so that is exactly what we need for closures. Uh, so, um, so, so that leads us uh, through the three problems to, to my primary question that, that I'm asking in this work, which is how can coastal discharge be accurately estimated and predicted for shellfish closures to ensure food safety? And, uh, and so, so my approach uh, to this is to combine uh, fluvial hydrology and, and estuarine physics, uh, 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 primarily using, using uh, river flood waves from, from fluvial hydrology. And so you may uh, wonder, what the heck is a, is a uh, river flood wave? Well, if you think about a precipitation event that may occur uh, inland, uh, it's, it's going to raise the water level locally. But then it may be hours or even days later for the water level to raise downstream. And so, so, so if we look at this, uh, from, from a larger perspective, we can, we can actually observe it uh, moving downstream as a wave, which is what uh, we're trying to capture on this video to the right uh, there, um, as, as the wave then moves from inland areas to the sea uh, downstream. So my hypothesis uh, for this work is that, is that coastal discharge can in fact be accurately estimated by, by obs observing uh, the river flood waves and, and predicting, and, sorry, and, and pr pr predicted uh, using, using theory from, from, a, from a fluvial hydrology to develop uh, a simple, simple analytical model. <clears throat> and, so, and so the primary objectives uh, for this work are to, are to one, uh, make, make uh, observations of, of the river flood waves, uh, looking at, at the, uh, the timing and the magnitude uh, downstream of the discharge events. And then second, to identify uh, uh, changes uh, spatially uh, across, across that, um, uh, that 
uh, uh, fluvial marine transition. And then also to look at the, the uh, temporal changes uh, throughout, throughout the past century. So have, are, are, we, are, are we using the same, the same uh, conditions now as we were using um, a, uh, a decade, five decades ago? Um, how consistent is this? Uh, and third, uh, to, uh, to, develop, to, to develop a simple analytical model uh, where we can actually predict, uh, predict coastal discharge and uh, fecal coliform. Uh, so, 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 the, so the goal in this as well is to make it reproducible so it can be used uh, widely in other places as well. Uh, so, so to do this work, uh, uh, the, the, the first part is, is uh, observational. Uh, in which, which uh, we plan to use um, coastal Alabama, which is, which is a great uh, representative system uh, and, and has, a high, has, has, a, has a high spatial resolution um, of uh, long-term discharge measurements as well as uh, long-term fecal coliform measurements. Uh, and then the second part is, is, a, is a, an analytical model uh, where we will uh, be merging uh, the components of, 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 a, of a tidal fluvial model uh, with a uh, river discharge model, uh, and then use this to test against uh, fecal coliform. Uh, so uh, in closing, uh, we looked at three different problems that led to the primary question, which is how can coastal discharge be accurately estimated and predicted uh, for shellfish closures to ensure food safety? And so, so this study uh, really aims to, aims to provide food safety, uh, try, to, try to stabilize um, economic markets, and, and ensure food national security, or as Ruth Carmichael might say, uh, prevent a, a nuclear holocaust. <laughs> she doesn't class quite often. But. So thank you. Thank you guys.